He is one of the most significant figures in German history, Otto von Bismarck, the Iron Chancellor. Honored and controversial, he has long been a legend. But just who was this man? What ideals did he follow? What made him strive for power? Göttingen, 1832. Even late at night, student life still holds sway in this university city. One student shows himself to be particularly devoted to drinking sessions and being rowdy boisterous. His name? Leopold Eduard Otto von Bismarck. Someone determined to make his mark, one way or the other. In Göttingen, the starting point for the careers of great statesmen and scholars, the arrival of this 17-year-old student from Eastern Pomerania is seen as a provocation. With an assumed indifference, Otto von Bismarck, striding in an extravagant coat, takes his dog for a walk, leaving him little time for his studies. Right from the start, young Bismarck ignored all rules. Coming straight from Eastern Pomerania and boarding school, getting and offered absolute freedom for Bismarck. He was with people of his own age, and easygoing student life was no different in those days from what it is today. You could drink, let your hair down, and even fence if you had the right connections. It was said that within one semester, he was victorious in 20 fencing bouts. That was remarkable, for one not only had to fence, but also to endure injury and then drink to excess, since the wounds needed to be disinfected. In fencing, Otto von Bismarck was unbeatable. In dueling, he showed courage, high risk and an iron determination. In three semesters, he lost only once to his opponents. That brought him respect. As a fencer in the arch-conservative Hanovera student corps, Bismarck constantly sounded out his own depths. From the very beginning, Bismarck had a wild temperament, and it was very difficult for him to rein it in. He had these two sides, a clear intellect and tremendous precision. It was the combination of his wildness and his intelligence that drove him to escapades, drunken excess or duels or fencing. Bismarck always wanted to fence to prove his manliness. I see him as a raging bull. For gross abuses against decency and morals, counted among them were public drunkenness, insulting behavior and disturbance of the peace, all of which landed the future lawyer in the university detention cell, he was held under arrest for 18 days. Hardly out of jail, he went on a rampage in a tavern. From then on, he was only allowed to enter the town of Göttingen to attend his lectures. Bismarck moved out to the edge of the town to a tower in the former city defences. Here he could indulge his excesses without interruption. The son of a Pomeranian landowner, he took no part at all in political life. In 1834, 20,000 demonstrators waving black, red and gold flags protested at the Hambacher Fest for freedom, civil rights and a unified German state. The demonstration was directed against Clemens Fürst von Metternich, who had attempted to stifle the liberal movement with censorship, banning orders and harsh punishment. 
the vision of a single unified Germany was still far off. The German Confederation, to which 40 sovereign German states belonged, was governed by Austria. The only common institution was the Assembly in Frankfurt, which held its meetings in the Palace of Thurn and Taxis. Bismarck was not to be won over by the aims and interests of his protesting fellow students. He found democratic student movements, with their dreams of unity in a free Germany, to be totally repugnant. For the enemies of the monarchy and their liberal pamphleteering, he had only hate and contempt. After changing universities and passing his examinations in Berlin, his path took him to Aachen. In 1836, in that cathedral city, he entered the sober, professional world of law. As an articled clerk in the provincial administration, this daredevil with a zest for life was obliged to spend his time rummaging through files. He quickly became bored with the monotonous office work in Aachen. The self-confident Bismarck now briefly entertained notions of a diplomatic career, but his request was turned down. Bitterly disappointed, he threw himself into costly adventures. The sophistication of the spa, whose waters drew prominent guests from all over Europe, tempted the fun-loving young Bismarck into one escapade after the other. Here he met the leading circles of aristocratic society and fell in love. She was 17 years old and professed to come from a good family, Isabella Lorraine Smith. The embodiment of an English beauty who brings my hot blood to boiling point, enthused Bismarck and invited his friends, rather too hastily, to Leicestershire for the wedding. Bismarck tried to pursue various affairs and wanted to marry early. But it all came to nothing. He paid court to two English women. One was a confidence trickster who claimed to be the Duchess of Kent, or someone similar, but was in fact the daughter of a woman from an ordinary background, while the other was the daughter of a high-ranking cleric in the Anglican Church, who frequented such social circles at the spa. All this fascinated him. It was a world he didn't know. The women were beautiful, leastways better than the country maids that he had known in Pomerania. His affairs and dissipation cast him into the first major crisis of his life. He could only finance his snobbery with debts until he went bankrupt and was forced to admit to his father this saddening fact. Bismarck went so far as to contemplate suicide and acquired, as he confided to a friend, a noose of yellow silk. After a short reflection, though, his gambler's nature won out. In the Arkham Casino, Bismarck challenged destiny. He could not settle his debts with the 200 Reichsthaler given to him by his father but he thought that by taking a gamble, there was a chance of doubling his money. At roulette, Bismarck revealed himself to be a gambler who would risk everything and win. He collected his first winnings in a mood of intoxication, convinced that his lucky streak would never end. He had won the enormous sum of 2,000 Reichsthaler, but it seemed far too sensible to stop now. Bismarck played on, enjoying the role of a rakish man about town. Inebriated on the notion of making a fortune at the gambling tables, Bismarck put everything on one number and lost.
His debts now totaled 1,700 Reichsthaler. But worse was to come. Bismarck had not appeared in his office for days, and now, with no more ado, the unreliable articled clerk was thrown out of work. Later, Bismarck was able to continue with his articles in Potsdam. But then, after just five months, he lost interest in the monotonous work and quit the position. And with that, his civil service career came to an end. Sitting all day at a desk, recording entries, passing them on, all of this was simply too confining for Bismarck. He wanted to get out and widen his horizons, to see distant places and enjoy some action. After his military service, Bismarck decided on a life on the land. When his father died, he took over the family estates in Pomerania and on the Elbe. Bismarck finally had to get down to earning money and to paying off his debts. It seemed to me to be just as respectable to grow corn as to write out administrative requisitions, is how he explained his transformation into a local squire. Bismarck didn't do such a bad job as a farm manager. He ran the estates profitably and with hard work and diligence began to reduce his debts, which he eventually paid off. Three years later, Bismarck was confronted with the next crisis in his life. Once again, he found his world too confining. Unmarried, very lonely, 29 years old, I run my business without participants, wrote the bored squire to a friend. Just as in his student days, he indulged himself with drinking companions. His ambition seemed to consist of smoking strong cigars and with cold-blooded amiability to drink his guests under the table. God knows, I couldn't be more drunk, he declared self-critically. Although this condition is one of the happiest that I can remember. Thus I vegetate, just like clockwork, without any special wishes or fears. Beer! Beer! Then one Sunday in the summer of 1843, Bismarck's zest for life returned. He got to know Marie von Tatten, the fiancé of a friendly neighbour. Bismarck was entranced by her charm, in which piety and sensuality were combined. But this woman who so fascinated him was already promised to Moritz von Blankenburg. Bismarck fell completely in love with this devout pietist Lutheran, and she reciprocated his feelings. He, known for his wildness and arrogance, adored her above all measure. Their relationship remained platonic. Cutting the ties with the one she had been promised to was unthinkable for the God-fearing Marie Fontaine. This deep relationship lasted for three years before Marie was torn from his life. She died at the age of 24 from meningitis. The death of the girl he loved so deeply was a great loss for Otto von Bismarck. An indication of their intensely close relationship was shown in the wish Marie made just before her death that he marry her best friend, an equally devout young girl. The one so selected was Johanna von Puttkamer, 
and Bismarck set about paying court to this daughter of a good house. And even though he had the worst of reputations, he ventured to ask her father for her hand. In the letter to Johanna's father where he asks for her hand, one senses that he now possesses a new strength, and he took this proposal very seriously. It was, in a way, almost sacred. Worshipful Herr von Puttkamer, I ask you for the most valuable possession that you have in the world to bestow, and that is the hand of your daughter. With masterful eloquence, Bismarck formulated his request, a foretaste of the diplomatic talents with which he would later steer European politics. Bismarck achieved his object. He married Johanna and moved with her into the estate at Schönhausen an der Elbe. The bond with Johanna brought peace for the first time into his life. Characterized by a Protestant sense of duty, she was both the self-sacrificing wife and soon thereafter the loving and caring mother of three children. The perfect complement to Bismarck, who also in marriage insisted on calling the tune. He was persuaded by Johanna to take part in religious life and he became part of the circle of conservative pietist Lutherans who were close to the royal family in Berlin. That brought him esteem and influence that later he would turn to his own advantage. Bismarck sensed that Johanna was the sort of woman who would stand close by him, who matched him in temperament, and who had the clarity and strength that he needed to become great. Genau das ausfüllt, was er braucht, um groß zu sein. A woman that was like a wall for him to lean against, and like a floor to lift him up. She was also a soulmate and understood him completely. In 1847, Bismarck was called to the new Prussian parliament in Berlin. With his career now set in motion by his pietist Lutheran supporters, the tearaway squire was to become an accomplished politician. In Parliament, Bismarck shone with speeches advocating a Prussian crown completely committed to a system of monarchy which incorporated aristocrats and landowners. In March of 1848, all of Europe was in uproar. Armed revolutionaries were also fighting in Berlin for democracy and national unity. When the rebellion threatened to endanger Friedrich Wilhelm IV, Bismarck's reaction was extreme. He mobilized his farmers and prepared a plan to rescue the monarchy. More than anyone else, Bismarck rejected the revolution. He went to Berlin, wanting at all costs to speak to the king, who for some time had indicated he would make concessions to the revolutionaries. Bismarck offered to arm his farmers and bring them to Berlin to put down the rebels, all of which was quite harebrained. Bismarck had assumed the role of a complete reactionary. He was the archetypal Prussian, loyal to his king and loyal to the government and against all the aims of a Liberal Front constitution. The spirit of freedom and democracy now moved through every institution. Liberal governments were formed. In the Paulskirche in Frankfurt, the first National Assembly met for the creation of a constitution. Then the army began making plans to bring a violent end to the revolution. The dream of a unified German national state was shattered, a triumph for Bismarck. Das Scheitern der 1848er Revolution The failure of the 1848 revolution is certainly the greatest catastrophe in the history of 19th century Germany. 
the concept of establishing the unity of Germany on the basis of the sovereignty of the people and a domestic policy that would not seek war with neighboring states was destroyed. The revolution had petered out. The revolution was defeated by the counter-revolution, which naturally pleased Bismarck greatly. He was no nationalist at this time, he was a Prussian, and he wanted to remain a Prussian. The flames of revolution had been smothered, and on the political front the burning issue was the German question. One opinion wanted to resolve the problem by creating the Greater Germany under Austria's leadership. The other preferred the Lesser Germany solution, in which Prussia had the controlling power. A German Reich in which Prussia was denied the superior position would be regarded by an ultra-conservative like Bismarck as a personal defeat. Bismarck was now developing a political instinct. In 1851, Bismarck was given the chance that he had waited for in vain as an articled clerk. Although he had no diplomatic training, Bismarck was named to join the Prussian representation at the German Confederation in Frankfurt. There he adroitly advanced himself, once again enjoying the help of his Protestant supporters. Finally, he had now entered the great arena of politics and was ready and on hand to deal with any issue that affected Germany's future. Bismarck was firmly convinced that God had chosen him as a tool. I am a soldier of God, he wrote to his wife, and I believe he has shaped my life to his needs. At the beginning of his new career, Bismarck paid scant regard to hierarchy or unwritten rules. The old guard diplomats regarded him with skepticism, but Bismarck knew how to engender respect. The privilege of smoking a cigar during conferences was enjoyed only by the Austrian representative. Bismarck directly assumed the same privilege for himself, a piece of provocation that was part of his poker game for power. Bismarck was the type of gambler who, trusting in God, believed he knew the exact moment to strike. Bismarck was enormously underestimated by his opponents. They presumed that a country yokel from Pomerania had come to Frankfurt. He was anything but that. He was well-educated, well-read and well-traveled, and had educated himself further. In the corridors of European diplomacy, he had acquired an edge. He had collected experience and had built up a network of contacts to leading European politicians, all of which was important for his later role as Prussian Prime Minister. In Frankfurt, Bismarck toyed with ideas of making Prussia bigger and more powerful. Later it would be said of him that he already had in mind the plan for unifying Germany. In his villa on the Bockenheimer Landstrasse, the diplomat enjoyed a life of conviviality. Everything was served here, everything there was in the world to eat and drink according to one of the numerous guests of this cosmopolitan household. It was a family idyll. Here, everyone is together, old and young, grandparents, children, dogs, eating, drinking, smoking, and playing the piano. Horizons were opened up for this ambitious politician through his numerous contacts. It was only with personalities from the arts or culture that he seemed to have nothing to say. Bismarck had a soft spot for the new art of photography. He gained no pleasure from most paintings. His interest was a means of giving expression to his own dreamy, sentimental nature. With this technology, 
he could be the one in control, staging a self-portrait that accorded with his ideas. He believed that the camera revealed his true being. With the help of photography, Bismarck now worked with a finer focus on his public representation. His self-willed character almost brought fatal consequences when Georg Freiherr von Finke challenged him to a duel in the early morning of March the 25th, 1852. The reason? During a parliamentary debate, Bismarck had referred to the upbringing of this liberal politician in mocking terms. Both shot wide. Their seconds were much relieved, but Bismarck complained about having no right to take a second shot. To someone with a gambling nature, a draw is repulsive. When the old king died in Berlin, his brother, Prince Wilhelm, took over the regency. The new monarch filled his cabinet with liberal aristocrats. The foreign minister, Graf Alexander von Schleinitz, was particularly concerned about improving relations between Prussia and Austria. Bismarck, with his radical anti-Austrian stance, was perceived to be out of place in Frankfurt and was moved to Russia. Bismarck had to be taken out of the game. He didn't fit in with the policies the new king wished to implement and was sent accordingly as ambassador to St. Petersburg. Bismarck described the move as being put on ice on the Neva. It also brought further humiliation. Normally, when the German ambassador was posted to St. Petersburg, he was given the rank of lieutenant general. Bismarck was obliged to take up his post in the modest uniform of a major in the territory. Bismarck felt that he was in exile in St. Petersburg, although here he could sharpen his perception of foreign relations. The feeling of being put out in the cold politically made him ill. A flu attack that kept him confined to his bed for weeks he described as Petersburg typhus. As an ambassador to the court of the Tsar, Bismarck formulated for the first time a grand plan for turning the kingdom of Prussia into the kingdom of Germany. He reminded the powers in Berlin of these notions without any illusion that his advice coming from so far away would even be listened to. After three years, he was sent to the Paris embassy. Bismarck would have to wait. From Paris, with his closest ally, Albrecht von Roon, the Prussian Minister of War, he began to pull the strings for his political ascent. In long conversations with Napoleon III, Bismarck gained a deep insight into the political thinking and psyche of the French ruler. In August 1862, on holiday, Bismarck got to know the 22-year-old Katerina Orlova, the wife of the Russian ambassador. He fell in love with this beautiful and spirited woman, who reminded him of his great love, Marie Fontaine. This passion also remained unfulfilled, but both of them began a romantic summertime flirtation. Prince Nikolai Orlov tolerated Bismarck's admiration for Katerina, his wife. As a threesome, they went on excursions and forgot the turbulence of politics. She is a woman for whom you could develop a passion if you knew her, wrote Bismarck to his wife at home, revealing warm enthusiasm without a trace of moral conflict. I am tremendously pleased, answered Johanna, that my beloved husband has found this fascinating woman without whose company he would never have enjoyed so much peace in one place. An olive branch 
proffered as a reminder of fleeting good fortune. Bismarck kept to the end of his life the parting gift given to him by his revered Kati, carefully stored in his cigar case. There were women whom he adored, where it was clear, and also clear to the general public, that for a certain time he would be quite infatuated. Johanna bore this in the knowledge that she had to give him this indulgence, or if she took too strong a line, she would lose him. In 1862, the king faced a debacle. He wanted to re-equip his army, but Parliament denied him the necessary funds. Wilhelm I dissolved the Parliament and ordered new elections. The opposition won with a large majority and once again blocked the military funding. Worn down and bewildered, the king retired to Schloss Babelsberg and wrote out his abdication. Simultaneously, Minister of War Rhone dispatched a telegram, periculum in mora, dépêchez-vous, danger in delay, hurry yourself. The addressee was his friend and ally, Otto von Bismarck. Bismarck left Paris at once and hurried to Berlin. He knew that this was the chance he'd been waiting for. As a convinced royalist, he regarded the king's abdication as a catastrophe. Bismarck swore his steadfast loyalty to his monarch, said that parliamentary rule must be hindered at all costs, if need be, through a long period of dictatorship. Words that convinced the king. Bismarck had persuaded the king to remain at the helm, where he would soon settle the crisis. He calculated that the king would remain the king, but he would become the power in Prussia. In September 1862, Bismarck tried to win over the opposition to the king's plan for a reformation of the army. With crushing oratory, he made his political line of attack quite clear. Not with speeches, he said, nor by majority decisions will the decisive moments of these times be decided. That gentleman was the great mistake of 1848 and 1849, but by iron and blood. Members of Parliament were left speechless. In Bismarck, a demon had been awakened, evoking war as a means for uncompromising politics. Only a few days later, this country squire from Altmarkt would be named Prime Minister of Prussia. An arch-conservative and without scruple, he would stop at nothing, even at a violation of the Constitution. As soon as he entered office, Bismarck dissolved the assembly and continued in government without parliament and without a budget. Basically, it was a coup d'etat. When Bismarck took office, he governed for a year without a budget. He had a sort of stopgap theory. He said that there was no provision in the Constitution for disagreements between King and Parliament. If they didn't agree, then government would have to be carried out by the King or the Prime Minister until both parties could come together. This had the features of a dictatorship or a coup. A period of political repression began in Prussia. Almost a thousand civil servants who were critical of the government were disciplined or dismissed. Political opponents were expelled. Bismarck had governed as Prime Minister for two years before he drove the king into his first war. The focus of political attention now moved to the north. Denmark's desire of separating the Duchy of Schleswig from that of Holstein was a source of conflict with the German Confederation. 
but Bismarck had sniffed in this conflict the possibility of annexing both of these states to Prussia. Bismarck's strategy was to draw Austria onto the side of Prussia. On the 1st of February, 1864, their combined troops marched into Denmark. A short but hard battle followed with serious losses on both sides. The well-equipped German army was far superior to that of the Danes. Nine months later, the Danish king was obliged to accept peace on Bismarck's terms. The result was that the duchies of Schleswig and Holstein were finally separated from Denmark, to be administered collectively by Prussia and Austria. That quickly caused tension between them and led them to disagree on just how the states should be administered, which then led to the next war. The disagreement escalated, and Prussia and Austria found themselves locked in a fraternal war. Within three weeks, the Prussian army achieved a decisive victory. 400,000 soldiers fought on the battlefield of Königgrätz, and Austria lost 44,000 men. Wilhelm I had triumphed and wanted to march into Vienna to humiliate Kaiser Franz Josef and snatch Bohemia away from him. But Bismarck set himself against the king and the military. The man who in his speeches had conjured up iron and blood now stood before a crucial test. In his despair, he went so far as to contemplate throwing himself from his window. My nerves could not withstand the thoughts that seized me day and night, and I fell into a terrible fit of crying. The crown prince calmed Bismarck and stood by him. Both feared that Prussian supremacy would force France into an intervention which would convert their military victory into a political disaster. Together they managed to persuade the king to make a peace agreement. What really affected him was this polarity in his soul. On the one hand, there was this visionary, the statesman, unbelievably far-sighted, with the strength to set great schemes in motion. And on the other hand, quite a timid person, wailing and often bewildered, a softer being, remarkably perceptive and very vulnerable. The victory of Königgrätz became Bismarck's triumph. Now Hanover, Schleswig-Holstein, Hesse, Nassau and the city of Frankfurt were all annexed by Prussia. Bismarck was celebrated in Berlin as a national hero. The German Confederation was disbanded and Austria was forced out of Germany. Bismarck had achieved his objective. All of the states north of the River Main were brought together in the North German Confederation, and Bismarck was the Chancellor. Now Bismarck had to bring the Catholic South to his side if he were to create a national German state. This gain in power would draw France into the plan. Bismarck adroitly provoked Napoleon III by exaggerating a trifle, the Spanish succession, making it into an international crisis. The 13th of July, 1870. In Bad Ems, the French ambassador tried to pressure the Prussian king into relinquishing for all time Hohenzollern claims on the Spanish crown. Behind this move was French anxiety of being closed in by the Hohenzollerns. Wilhelm I declined. A report of the meeting was delivered that same evening to Bismarck. He shortened and altered the message 
and directed his version, the so-called Emza de Pesha, to the press. The reaction of the king now appeared significantly sharper and harder than it had actually been. The Depesha, according to Bismarck, would have the effect of a red rag to the Gallic ball. His calculation bore fruit, and the French Emperor Napoleon III declared war on Prussia. As Bismarck had planned, France had become the aggressor. The war makers could confidently count on armed support from the south. The visionary national German state edged a little closer on the battlefield. Soldiers from all parts of Germany were fighting together for a joint victory. In the Battle of Sedan in the Ardennes on the 1st of September 1870, the French army was beaten. Napoleon III was captured and taken to Schloss Wilhelmshöhe in Kassel. Of his meeting with Napoleon III, Bismarck wrote to his wife Johanna, Our conversation was difficult, as I didn't want to touch on matters that would be so painful to one who had been so cast down by God's hand. Historically, it is an international achievement, a victory for which we should in all humility thank God. The balance at Sedan, 25,000 dead and wounded. The war fueled the hate of both sides to such a degree that for decades Germany and France would remain enemies. In the peace negotiations, France lost Alsace as well as part of Lorraine and had to pay many millions of francs as war reparations. After the war with France, negotiations then began with the South German states. At last, Bismarck's vision of national unity would be completed. King Ludwig II of Bavaria was skeptical, but he could be bought. When Bismarck offered him a handsome sum from the wealth that had been confiscated from the Welfen family, the king gave way and sold off the sovereign state of Bavaria to the Prussians. On the 18th of January, 1871, the German Reich was founded in the Hall of Mirrors in Versailles, and Wilhelm I was proclaimed Kaiser. Two months later, Otto von Bismarck reached the height of his power as he was named the first Chancellor of the German Reich.